Venerable religious, dear parishioners, we begin the pre-Lenten season today. In her great wisdom, Holy Mother Church knows that we can't just, or are we not advisable to just go straight from a season of celebration or at least where there's a season of penance not being emphasized to go right into Ash Wednesday. So the church is preparing us. Uh, the church already takes away from us the Alleluia. We will not hear it again until Easter Sunday. We see purple vestments. Again, the wisdom of the church in knowing that we need a pre-Lenten season. So now is the time to look ahead to Lent and plan now what we will be doing. So what does the church convey to us on this Septuagesima Sunday to put us in the right spirit of planning to have a penitential, virtuous, prayerful observance of Lent. The church puts before our eyes today the idea salvation is not guaranteed. None of us can say, I've got it made I am going to end up in heaven. No, we do not have that guarantee. We look at the epistle and gospel for today. St. Paul start, tells us how he is chastising himself. He's, I mean, it sounds like he's even using a, a cord to whip himself along with his fasting and all the other sufferings that he's going to tell us about next Sunday. Even he, he says, I have to chastise myself because even I can fall away. So if St. Paul needed to do penance, you and I need to do penance. We also hear St. Paul telling them telling the Corinthians, and of course he was talking about the chosen people in the Old Testament, they were all called. But what happened? Most of them, God was not well pleased with them because they were not repenting, repenting of their sins. A little, little bit of a parenthetical thing here just so we understand it. All fathers were all under the cloud. Remember in their wanderings through the desert that there was a cloud that led them. That was the presence of God, the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. All passed through the sea. All were baptized in Moses. So they were all called to be part of God's kingdom. But so many of them, not prove themselves faithful to God. All ate the same spiritual food. By this, St. Paul means the manna that fell from heaven. This was not produced here on earth. This was produced supernaturally. It literally fell from heaven because they had to wander for 40 years in the desert. They were not worthy. They were not prepared to go straight into the promised land. So 40 days of, excuse me, 40 years of wandering in the desert. We can think of our Lent not being the 40 years, but the 40 days where we have to go through or endure the desert so that we may more fittingly enter the promised land. So 40 days of Lent so that we can enter the promised land of Easter. So they ate the same spiritual food. They all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock which followed them. Do you remember that time in the desert they were perishing from thirst? And God commanded Moses to strike the rock with his rod. And unfortunately, even Moses faltered in his faith. He didn't strike it once. He struck it twice. Once would have been enough. Just strike the rock. And out of that rock gushed the water, and it followed them. So what St. Paul is saying, remember, they were all, they were 
protected by God under the cloud. They passed through the sea. Remember how Moses parted the, the Red Sea so they could all make it through safely, and then God drowned Pharaoh and his whole army. So God did all of that for them. He called them. He provided for them daily in the desert. And when they needed water, he miraculously produced it. And still, God was not well pleased with most of them. We look at the history of the human, or rather of the Jewish people, the chosen people in the Old Testament, and so much sinning, so much turning away from God, so much spiritual adultery that they committed over and over again. So you see, it's not enough to be called. One has to also repent and respond to that loving call of God. One other thing that, that uh, St. Paul mentions, the rock was Christ. And this is a reminder of how many things in the Old Testament prefigure Christ. And that rock in the desert gushing out water, which continued to be this flowing stream following after them, he said, in, an, in a way, that's a prefigurement of Christ, who would nourish us, who would relieve our spiritual thirst. Sometimes you may have seen in Catholic art, the seven sacraments portrayed as not just one stream, but seven streams of water coming out of the rock, which is Christ. It's a symbol of Christ. And that water gushing out are the graces of the seven sacraments. So St. Paul finds it important to get in that spiritual or that prefigurement idea. He says, remember, the Old Testament prefigures the new. It's unmistakable how the Old Testament leads to the New Testament. This is why I love to read the Old Testament. It's not the eternal covenant which Jesus made at the Last Supper in his passion and death. This is the chalice of my blood. But the Old Testament was a preparation. And we see hundreds of prophecies about our Lord. And, and no longer does one have to be of Jewish blood to be called. Now it's for everyone, Jew and Gentile. Jew and non-Jew. The bloodline is not important anymore as it was in the Old Testament. One more reminder of nobody's guaranteed salvation. Look at the last sentence of the gospel. The last shall be first and the first last for many are called but few are chosen. In the opinion of some of the saints, and spiritual writers, the majority lose their souls. You may want to read sometime the sermon of Blessed Leonard of Port Maurice. He does say that. He's convinced that the majority will refuse to do their part to save their souls. Now, this is not official church teaching because you'll find other spiritual writers arguing that you know, it's not the majority. But nevertheless, they all agree that many, many, many are lost. At times, the majority are being lost. I would have to say one of those times is now when we see how many are deprived of the true mass and the sacraments. The spiritual enemies of the world, the flesh and the devil, are overwhelming so many. But the church herself does not know what that number is, what that percentage is. There's one of the orations in the, in the Mass, one of the hundreds and hundreds of orations, O oh God, to whom alone it is known the number of the saved. So you see, the church does not know, was not revealed. And I can see the wisdom of God in that not telling us what exact percentage, because if it was 
a greater percentage, we might have a false hope. Oh, it's, it's an easy thing to, be, to save one's soul. No, it isn't. So you see, this is what the church puts in front of our eyes on Septuagesima Sunday. Don't guarantee yourself or promise yourself heaven. You can't. Nobody can. Work out your salvation as St. Paul uh, does. I run with not without a purpose. I do not beat the air, but I chastise my body and bring it into subjection, lest perhaps after preaching to others, I myself should be rejected. But let's not forget the very positive aspect that St. Paul gives to us. He's talking about running a race. Back in his day, there was no World Series, Super Bowl, <laughs> championship for basketball, national championship. There was none of that. But there were chariot races and there were foot races. And over in Greece, they had other Olympics-type contests. So St. Paul points to that and says, here's your motivation. We do chastise ourselves, yes, but it's only in the sense that people who want to win the foot race chastise themselves ahead of time. They do rigorous training. They deny themselves many things. Why? Because they want that laurel wreath upon the top of their heads. They live for that. They breathe it. And of course, only one can win it. But he says, think of your spiritual life as that race and put that kind of effort into it as the one who says, I want to win the race. I want to be number one in the race. He says, after all, nobody says, oh, I plan to be fifth or I plan to be 20th. No, at the very least, they're all saying, I'm going to do the very best that I can and hopefully it'll be the first place. So St. Paul puts a very positive view upon that. So it's in the motivation. You know, again, just making a reference to modern sports, you know, there's no such thing as just starting a season. They go through very rigorous training, the athletes do, before, you know, they can begin to compete. Same thing spiritually. Lent is a necessary time for us to, to till our spiritual garden to do some really hard work. And by the way, there's another reference there in the all the people being hired throughout the day it's the idea of work you don't just get paid because you showed up you got paid because you worked and yes he was very generous with those who were hired last there's a lesson here not to be jealous of others not to be envious they all got paid a just wage. It's just that the householder chose to give more to those who were hired later on. But again, work, labor. But keep the positive view. The more you are motivated, the more we are all motivated, the more we're willing to do. So... St. Paul says, you, yes, you can even look at the athletes. They're only going to get a perishable crown. It will not mean anything after this life. But in eternity, it will mean very much that you did your best, that you kept before your eyes the crown, the prize, which won't fade away, but which will last eternally. So persevere, always persevere in prayer, persevere in good works. Keep advancing towards that crown that God wishes you to have someday. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.